Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. The weather has been interesting recently. This week is going to continue to be interesting, this roller coaster ride of weather. So today is cold, and it's going to be warm and cold and warm and cold. But that is main weather. So um, glad that you're here today. Welcome. And uh, if you're here for the first time or the first time for a long time, welcome and uh, glad that you are joining us today. For those on Facebook Live, welcome to you as well. Let me read a passage from Psalm 8 that I've been uh, focusing on this past week as we prepare to sing and worship. It says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Uh, the opening songs that we're going to sing today are focused on God the Father. And so let's think of our good, good Father as we sing these songs together this morning. So let's stand together and let's worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. Yeah. 
be seated. Before our kids head off to their groups, let's take a moment and let's talk to our Heavenly Father this morning. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we begin this new day, this new week, Lord, we stop to pause, to talk to you, to come into your presence. Lord, you invite us to come into your presence at all times. Lord, you are never too busy for us. You're never too preoccupied with all of the affairs of the world. Lord, even though uh, Queen Elizabeth has been diagnosed with COVID today, Lord, uh, all of the big events of a possible invasion by Russia into Ukraine, Lord, in spite of all those big events of the world, you still have time for us, your children. Lord, that even the greatest issue that we would say is greater than we would know how to comprehend, Lord, there is nothing that is too big, too complicated for you. There is nothing that is impossible for you. But Lord, in your greatness and your majesty, Lord, you have seen fit to create this world and this universe and to create human beings. Lord, as frail as we are, the dust of the earth, Lord, you have created us exactly as you intended in the beginning to be holy and pure. Lord, we have rebelled from you. We have walked away from you. Yet in spite of that, you still love us with an everlasting love. Lord, you still care for us. You still want the best for us. You want that relationship with us. So God, thank you, thank you, thank you for being our God, for being the one that has rescued us and the one that will take care of us to the end. Lord, we bless your holy name today. Great is your faithfulness towards your people. Lord, thank you for the children that are here today and for the young people and for the adults that will guide them and lead them today. Lord, bless their time together as you will bless our time in this room and for those watching online. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So children, you can go off in that direction to your groups at this time. And I'm going to ask Zeb to come up as he will be reading scripture for us this morning. Good morning, everyone. I was looking at the differences of the Bibles right here. I'm going to read from Pastor Scott's because it's a little bit bigger print than mine. So, <laughs> so I'm reading out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, trash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godlessness, but denying its power, having nothing to do with such people. They are the kind whom warm, warm, sorry, their way into homes, and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jimbreus opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of deprived minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. All right, thanks guys. 
Okay, thanks, Seb. So I want to take a moment as we begin this morning to, as we are still early in this new year, to think about vision and to think about what our church might look like two or three years from now. So if we could put the first uh, slide on the screen. This is what I would call preferred vision. This is what I would, and, and I've been talking about for the last number of weeks, the last six weeks or so, is what I would desire our church to be like a year from now, two years, three years from now. So it's a preferred vision. And it is this, uh, and this is maybe the sixth time I've said it so far this year. You need to commit, and we need to commit, not just being to being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, but also being a disciple maker, a spiritual trainer. Jesus said two very important things about this topic 2,000 years ago when he was here on earth. He said to people, come, follow me. Come, follow me, and be my disciple, be my student, be my follower. But he also said to these same disciples, he says, therefore now, go, or as you go, make disciples and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's a disciple maker. So, you're to think of yourselves in these two aspects, to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and also to be a disciple maker, a spiritual trainer. So, whether you see yourself today as one that is like, uh, I'm not yet a disciple, that's okay. If you see yourself as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, then this message is going to be for you today. Or if you have come to the place that's like, okay, yeah, I see myself as a disciple and a disciple maker, though I don't understand all what that is yet, but I'm heading in that direction, this message is for you today as well. I've entitled the message, Watch Out for Spiritual Scammers. Watch out for scammers spiritual scammers. Scammers make my blood boil. Maybe they do you as well. Hackers and scammers. So let's first talk about physical scammers. They really get me going. Because physical scammers, their intent is to go and to scam the most vulnerable people. And oftentimes in our society today, the most vulnerable people are elderly people. And they target you to try to get your money away from you or your information away from you. They also target those that are maybe naive, young people, children, teenagers, young adults. They haven't lived enough yet in the world to know the difference, and they try to scam you. Or maybe those that are just simply, we would say, are gullible, that they fall for whatever comes along. Now, let me just kind of give you a, 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 a free public service announcement for a moment. And you see this ad on the TV a lot these days. So for physical scammers, I would say to you this morning, and for those watching online, watch out. <laughs> Be careful. If someone calls you on the phone and they are asking for gift cards, don't ever give gift cards because they're scammers. If someone calls you on the phone and sounds like your grandson or your granddaughter or a relative, what do they say? Hang up call that relative back to see if they're in trouble. But never give anything over the phone. And then thirdly, if they call you and they ask for your social security number, never give it to them over the phone. 
if they ask for your banking information, never give it to them over the phone. Because those are physical scammers. They're imposters. And they're not the real thing. Watch out. Be careful. Now, we come to our text this morning that Zeb read a moment ago in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1. Now, Paul is not talking about physical scammers. He's talking about spiritual scammers, because there is such a thing. We started talking about this last week, and we're going to talk about this continuing today. Watch out for spiritual scammers. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to put two verses on the screen, and they're from Acts chapter 20. So let's put those on the screen, please. Now, the context of these verses, these, these statements. The Apostle Paul, that we mentioned a couple weeks ago, as he writes to Timothy, he is in a dungeon. Remember, he's in jail. Now, Acts 20 is previous to this by a little bit. Paul is on his way to the city of Jerusalem. He is compelled to go there. Now, he knows if he goes there, he's going to get in trouble, and he did. He ended up getting arrested, and he ended up ultimately getting into the place of being in the dungeon. But as he travels to the city of Jerusalem, this is Acts chapter 20, he wants to, knowing that maybe he's getting towards the end of his life, that this may not go well, he wants to go and say farewell to his friends. And so he comes to a place, uh, he's on a ship, and he comes to a place, Miletus, and he has sent words to the elders at the church in Ephesus, where Timothy is now the pastor. And he says, come down to the beach some distance away, come meet me at the boat, and I want to pray for you, I want to, I want to uh, spend some time with you. So they had this brief meeting, it's a very emotional meeting, if you've ever read Acts chapter 20. But I just want us to focus on these two statements. He says this, Paul is saying this to the, to the leaders of that church. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves, picture that in your mind, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Now, he's not literally talking about a physical wolf or a physical flock of sheep, but he's using that imagery, okay? And then second, he says, even from your own number, Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Now, the second statement, we don't know. Scholars are, we don't really know how to take that. Because literally what Paul could be saying, even from your own number, and most likely that was the case, from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. So, that's a very serious thing. Now, some time has gone by, and this exact thing is happening. And Paul is now writing to Timothy, and he says, okay, I need to warn you. I'm going to warn you again. Be very careful. So, we come to chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, but mark this. Mark this well, and don't forget it is what he says here. Mark this well. Write this down. Don't forget this. In verse 1, he says, there will be terrible periods of time in the last days. Now, that would be very easy to misunderstand. First of all, what is this term, last days? Last day is the way Paul uses it, is the period of time from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. So we are in the last days. We are in somewhere in that time frame of the last days. But Paul says there will be periods of times or seasons of time that it's going to be terrible because these false teachers, these scammers are going to come along and they are going to try to trick you and they're going to try to destroy you as Christians, and destroy the church. Now, that's scammers, because scammers, the bad part about scammers is you never know when they're going to show up. 
you never know when they're gonna, the phone is gonna ring and it's gonna be a scammer. It's not really gonna be your grandson, it's gonna be someone imitating your grandson, right? That's the bad part about spiritual scammers. You don't know when they're going to show up. But Paul says, be warned, they will show up. And you have to be very careful as you go through time. And then we come to verse 2. Men or people will be lovers of themselves. This is an overall statement of these spiritual scammers. It's the same for physical scammers, isn't it? They love themselves. They are going to go and try to get your money. They're going to try to get your information because they care nothing about you. They care only about themselves. So my first point this morning is this, as we describe spiritual scammers. Spiritual scammers love themselves more than other people. Spiritual scammers love themselves more than other people. Now, you might think back if you've been <laughs> around long enough to about mm, 35 years ago now. First time I really ever heard of a national so-called Christian leader that was a scammer. And the scam was quite, quite great. When news broke that this couple that was running this large national ministry had put air conditioning into their dog's doghouse, you knew something was terribly wrong. All this money was coming in from people all across the country, and how were they using it? They were using it to put air conditioning into the doghouse out in the backyard. Why did they do that? They were scamming people because they loved money, they loved all of this more than they loved the people. Or even the last few years, there's been a so-called Christian pastor who bought a brand new jet for his personal use that cost $65 million. $65 million jet for his private use. Spiritual scammers love themselves more than other people. Now, usually it's not that obvious. It can be a lot more subtle, and that's why we have to be very careful in to watch out. Now, verse 2, these people, these people will be lovers of themselves. These people who claim to be Christian, who claim to be disciple makers, who even claim to be spiritual trainers, these are the ones that we're talking about. And let's go and put a verse on the screen. Matthew 7, verse 15. This is what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. He says, watch out for false prophets, false teachers. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. That is what makes false teachers and these spiritual scammers so dangerous because they show up and they look like sheep. They look very innocent, but they're imposters, and they do great damage. So they're pretenders, and they're imposters, and they do great damage. Now we come to the rest of verse 2 through verse 5. There is... 18, Paul gives to us 18 traits or characteristics of these spiritual scammers. Uh, we're going to go through these very quickly because it, it's not pleasant. Uh, when I was a, a young boy growing up in the 1970s, so a long time ago, uh, on a really hot summer day, we would walk down our street, and about a quarter of a mile from our house where I grew up was the ocean. So on a really hot day, we would go down, and there was a place still called Sandy Beach. Now, don't think of Sandy Beach in my hometown as the Sandy Beach, like at Acadia. It's not that fancy or that big. But there was a, a beach probably not much wider than this room, but it was a place you were able to access the ocean without climbing down over rocks. My hometown is a very rocky place. Rockland. <laughs> Makes sense, right? So there was a beach you could go down, 
But at low tide, and low tide, if you're not familiar with tides, happen, happens twice a day. So twice a day, the tide would completely go out, the water would go out, and if you were there at very, very low tide, where we'd sometimes go swimming, was this huge metal pipe, huge pipe. Didn't think much of it as a kid. It's like, there's just a pipe there. Until years later, discovered that was the sewer pipe. That was the sewage pipe. All of the sewer, and you know what sewer is, all of the sewer from the whole south end of our town went out through that into the ocean in the 1970s before they made the waste treatment plant. That's where we'd go swimming. Sewage. Now, this is sewage. This is all the sewage that comes out of the hearts of these scammers. So are you ready? Put on your seat belts. Here we go. They are lovers of themselves. They are lovers of money. Outwardly, they are boastful. Inwardly, they are proud and arrogant. They are self-absorbed. They are abusive with their tongue. They like to gossip behind people's backs. They are rebels at heart. They rebel, they rebel against authority, even their own parents. They are ungrateful, refusing to be thankful. They're unholy, heartless, without love, unforgiving, slanderous. They use the tongue, their tongue, to hurt other people. They're without self-control, no self-restraint. They are brutal, savage like wolves, haters of good treacherous, traitors, not loyal friends like we talked about last week. They may pretend to be a loyal friend, but they're not. They're rash and reckless, and the word here is like for reckless driving, acting without regard for others. They're conceited, inflated with pride, lovers of pleasures, not lovers of God. And when we go through that list, we say, oh my goodness, Paul must be describing corrupt politicians. Well, maybe he is. Or we say, well, Paul is describing, you know, leaders of a big corporation that doesn't care about the little guy. And maybe he is. But we come to verse 5, and we see what Paul is actually, who he's actually describing. Having a form of godliness. Having a form of godliness, but denying his power. Have nothing to do with such people. So these are people that we would look at and say, oh, they are very religious. These are very Christian people. These are very Christian leaders. But they're imposters. They're not the real thing. Uh, I talked about uh, Sandy Beach a moment ago. And uh, in the 1970s, it's not true today because it's kind of been overfished, but what we would go and do as kids, we would go to Sandy Beach, and we would go and collect uh, sea glass. There was a lot of sea glass in those days. Uh, there was a lot of shells, and we would go and, and collect shells, and we'd make craft projects and do all kinds of stuff, you know, kids would do. But occasionally, especially right down by the water's edge, we would be deceived. I would be deceived because it's like, oh, there's a crab. Let's go look at the crab. And you get to the crab, and it's like, yeah, it looks like a crab but there was no crab inside. There was a shell. So either a seagull had come and eaten the crab or it had molted its shell, shell or whatever. So it looked at a distance like it was a real life crab, but it wasn't. And that's the term that Paul uses here, that they have this outward shell, but they don't have any heart inside. There is nothing of any substance inside that makes them so dangerous. They don't have any power. Now, these false leaders, these false teachers, they might say something like this, that you can save yourself, or you can change yourself, but they have an absence of spiritual power, the absence of Jesus. So here's the takeaway we'll put on the screen. Now, here's the truth. Only Jesus can save you. You can't save yourself, not by reading some um, self-help book or taking some kind of whatever course. Only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus can transform you. And only Jesus can restore you. If anybody, if they're saying anything else, and you can kind of read between the lines, it's like, 
hmm, they seem to be, <laughs> they've left Jesus out of here, out of the equation. That's usually a really good indicator that they're not the real thing. Paul wrote to Titus in Titus 1.16. They claim to know God. Because all these people that I'm talking about today, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So let's come back to verse 5 again at the very end. He says, have nothing to do with such people. Avoid them. It's a very strong verb. Stay away from them. Have nothing to do with them. Now, the third point as we go to verses 6 and 7 is spiritual scammers prey on the weak and the vulnerable. The spiritual scammers prey on the weak and vulnerable in the same way as physical scammers do. And so now Paul describes their action. And it seems like he has a very... Um, practical illustration here of something that he was very well aware of in verse 6. It says, they are the kind who worm or wiggle, literally is what it says, wiggle their way into homes. Uh, cults are known for this. Uh, when they read an obituary in a newspaper, and this is what they do, they read an obituary in the, in the newspaper, they go and they track down this person. They show up, and they wiggle their way in. It's like, oh, we're so sorry for your loss. Look at this. We brought all this food with us. We will come back every Saturday morning. We will come back once a week to help you. If you need things around your house, I'm so sorry that your, your, father, your, your, your husband has passed away. We'll come and, and do all this stuff. And so they wiggle their way in. And so cults do this, and spiritual scammers do the same thing. This is what's happening here, and Paul's talking about that. And they gain control. The word, the phrase gain control is they literally take you prisoner of war. And you don't even know it. They take you prisoner. And with their false information. And then he says, and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires or passions. So spiritual scammers, they look for the gullible. Now in this case, 2,000 years ago, it may have been women, uneducated, um, and so they could be very gullible. Verse 7, it says they were uh, very interested in spiritual things, and so when the spiritual scammers came along, they were like, boom, they would just go and, and grab for it. It's like, okay, not really asking any questions. And so Paul says, be very careful. Now, this is an illustration of a story I've told you many times over the years, but maybe kind of a little bit closer at home to me. When I was in Bible college, you know, 100 years ago, a long time ago now, uh, they warned us as freshmen, as first-year students, the, college, the Bible college I went to, there was a campus, and then the dorms where we lived in those days, they were off campus, and so we had to walk uh, maybe a quarter of a mile. And on Thursday mornings, as students walked from the dorms to chapel service, there would be cult members there in their white shirts waiting for us. They knew that we had been listening to a lot of Bible talk in our classes, even reading our Bibles, but we had not come to any conclusions, as Paul says, about the truth. So we were very gullible at that point, and our leaders would, don't talk to them, don't, because there are stories across the country and around the world, I'm sure, that cults, that's when you say, well, I mean, these are Bible college students, yes, but they have this great desire to know spiritual things. They have uh, this great passion. This, uh, it's the same word that we saw last week that Paul says, flee from these juvenile emotions and passions. Uh, First-year students in Bible college, they have a lot of passion. They have a lot of excitement, and it's like, okay, if they can get 
you know, get a hook into them, a cult can easily take them and grab them and take them away. And that is what Paul is talking about here. So they look for gullible people. They look for those who have guilt or shame or regret because spiritual scammers go for the heart rather than the mind. They look for those who are controlled by their emotions and passions. They look for someone who will fall to the latest fad or the latest teaching. Now, verse 8 is interesting. It says, Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Now, who are these two men? And how did they oppose Moses? So we go back and we search all the way through the Old Testament, and they're never mentioned. So who are they? So in this case, we have to go to Jewish tradition. And all scholars, all scholars agree that this Jewish tradition gives us some really, really important information. In Exodus chapter 7, now in Exodus chapter 7, think about this for a moment. Moses, who is the appointed leader of God and of the Jewish people, goes to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember that story? And God has given Moses special powers, that he has his staff that a shepherd would have, and he can throw down his staff, his stick, and it turns into what? Into a snake. So I was like, ooh, okay, that would be pretty impressive. But in, Ex in, in Exodus chapter 7, remember that there were people in Pharaoh's court, his guys that also had magical powers, that they could go and do the same thing, and, and their staffs would turn into snakes. And it's like, see, Moses, you're no big, big deal. Jewish tradition tells us that the names of these two men are found here in 2 Timothy that these two men who worked for Pharaoh, who had these magical powers, who actually could do miracles, converted to the God of Israel. They became disciples of the God of Israel, and when the whole plagues came about, and remember the Israelites left Egypt, and they went out into the Sinai Desert, and they were, God rescued them, these two guys went with them. Now, this is what Jewish tradition and, and Judaism teaches. Once they get to Mount Sinai, remember Mount Sinai, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive Ten Commandments. These two men are the ones, supposedly, that whispers into Aaron's ear, into the leader's ear, that says... Moses is never coming down off that mountain. He's overdue. He should have been back three days ago, whatever, two days ago. He's not coming back. And this God of Israel, not the real thing. We need to take matters into our own hands, and we need to go and create what? Golden calf. These two men supposedly were the ones that were behind that. Moses, of course, comes down off the mountain. <laughs> Remember how upset he was? It's like, <laughs> because the second commandment of the Ten Commandments is do not make any, yeah, graven image. Do not go and make a god in your own image or in any physical image. And that's what they had done in a very short period of time. And so in, I think it's Exodus 20 or something like that, uh, the uh, rest of the, uh, let's see, if you're taking notes here, Exodus 32, it says that uh, these men are taken care of. We come to verse 9, back in our text, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of these men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Over time, these two men that were really not <laughs> disciples and converts to the God of Israel, they were exposed for who they really were. And in all spiritual scammers, it might take a long time, but at some point they will be exposed for who 
they really are. And so that is the good news, I guess, that we have from today. So two applications as we begin to wrap up this morning. And the first one goes really back to last week. And if you were here last week, and if you weren't here last week, let me just review it. You need to realize, you need to realize whether you are not yet a disciple of Jesus or you are a disciple of Jesus or you're a disciple maker, you need to realize that there are Christian, and I'm putting in quotation, there are, quote, there are Christian leaders and there are Christian sermons and Christian books and Christian YouTube videos and study guides, whatever we want to say, they're not all created equal. Because some of these, you say, well, wait a minute, I, I heard a sermon in a church. I, I heard this information from someone standing up in front of a crowd like you are. It has to be true. No, it's not. Not necessarily. Because there are preachers, both in churches, on TV, on the radio, who writes books, who does YouTube videos, they're not all created equal. And Paul says you have to watch out. You have to go and really study and look at what they're actually teaching and how they're living. That's what we talked about last week. Now, here's the application for today. Test every message that claims to be Christian against the Word of God, against the Bible. Because this is our final authority. Test every message that claims to be Christian. Just because the Christian label is put on there doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually the truth. So we have to be careful. Because remember, Jesus said, these ferocious wolves may appear as sheep. And you have to be very careful. Now, let me say this, and every previous pastor in this church, probably back for 186 years, has said what I'm about to say. And it's good to say it from time to time. When you listen to my message as your pastor at United Baptist Church, you are always to go in to listen to it and take notes. But if there's anything that doesn't sound quite right, then you are to come to me and say, mm, I think you're going off the, the rails here. And, you know, or call me or send me an email. It's like, I, this doesn't seem to be jiving with the rest of the Bible. You are always, always free to do that. For Acts 17, verse 11 says this. If we can put it up on the screen. Now the Berean Jews, Berea was the name of a town, the Jews living in Berea were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, in the city of Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So you have to do that, even with my messages, but with all messages. So if you're watching something on YouTube, just because it's on YouTube doesn't mean it's true or correct. Or you read it in a book, and you say, well, I've got it from a, you know, uh, a Christian publishing house. doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. You have to go and look at all the messages and make sure that it's accurate and good. So, watch out for spiritual scammers. Don't be scammed. Be careful what you believe. Be careful what you believe. Now, I don't want this sermon and message today kind of be a downer. I know it's kind of like, ooh. So let's, let's end on a positive note. As we look at those 18 characteristics of spiritual scammers, I mean, and they're like, ugh, who wants to even read that list? Let us, in comparison... Think of the Lord Jesus. For the spiritual scammers, what did it say? That they, what did it say in 
Verse 2, they were lovers of themselves. Let's think about Jesus for a moment. Jesus was not one who cared all just about himself. He came to the world to love other people because he's the real thing. He's not a scammer. He's the real thing. He came to love other people. Spiritual scammers, they are all about loving money. What does the Bible say about Jesus? Jesus came to earth and he became poor, very poor, so that we could become spiritually rich. Scammers, they are lovers of pleasure and not lovers of God. Jesus, on the other hand, gave up all the pleasures of heaven and came to earth 2,000 years ago. Philippians 2 says he humbled himself and became obedient even to death, death on a cross. And so when we go and we see those 18 reasons not to follow the, the spiritual scammers, we can begin to come up with a list of thousands, maybe 10,000 reasons why Jesus is the real thing and why we can trust him and we can trust his word and his actions in that we can follow him. For he is trustworthy. He is the real thing. When we go and we compare against what is not the real thing, we see more evidently and more, more clearly of who Jesus really is and how real he is. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and we are going to sing our final song today that we've specially chosen to be able to respond to who Jesus is, the real thing. And we have 10,000 reasons to worship who he is. So let's sing this song together.
Thank you, worship team. Let me share with you a couple of announcements. Uh, over here, as you lead today, you'll see an orange and a blue pail, kind of like a pail you would have like at, a, at the beach. And you have the option of signing up for one or two things. You can sign up for both. We are asking for people, we're looking for people to pray for our children. So if you would like to do that on a regular basis, um, that's the orange bucket. And if you'd like to pray for one of our missionaries, that is the blue bucket. So they'll be there for the next uh, couple of weeks. And we would like uh, prayer, especially for our children and for our missionaries. So at this time, we're going to say farewell to our friends on Facebook Live and live stream. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a great week.